In February of 2014, AMD had expanded their mid-range lineup with the Radeon R7 265 and R7 260, while simultaneously dropping the price of their R7 260X to 120 USD to compete with Nvidia's GTX 650 Ti. Around a week later, Nvidia fired back with their legendary Maxwell 1.0 cards, the GTX 750 Ti and GTX 750. Today we'll be focusing on the GTX 750 side of things, as I don't own the fully unlocked GTX 750 Ti. Anyhow, the card is using the GM107 GPU, specifically a slightly cut down one codenamed GM107-300A2. It has 512 shading units and is clocked at 1020MHz, with a boost clock of up to 1085. The VRAM configuration consists of 2GB of GDDR5 clocked at 1253MHz, which is running on a 128-bit bus making for a total memory bandwidth of 80GB per second. It supports up to RegX 12, which is great, but only the feature level 11.0, meaning a lot of the newest AAA games won't even launch on this card. However, if you're looking to play some newer, simpler games and esports titles, this feature level requirement shouldn't be a problem. Along with this, we also have OpenGL 4.6 support as well as Vulkan 1.3 support, which is nice to have. The card uses a meager 55 watts of power when in use, so it can be used in pretty much any system that has a PCIe slot. As I mentioned before, the GTX 750 was Nvidia's mid-range card in their GTX 700 series. Despite being a part of the GTX 700 series though, the GTX 750 was not a Kepler part like the rest in the 700 and 600 series family. Rather, it was based on the shiny new Maxwell architecture. Well, I say that, but in essence Maxwell was just a refinement of the Kepler architecture. Maxwell wasn't focused too much on improving performance over Kepler, but geared more towards power efficiency, as Maxwell doubled the performance per watt over its predecessor, all while on the same 28 nanometer node, which is kind of amazing to say the least. There were numerous changes that Nvidia made to accomplish this, but the main one was forgoing the resource sharing of Kepler. While sharing resources between schedulers could provide a great performance boost in the right workloads, they were wasting power when not being utilized, and the crossbar to connect them would require more power and GPU die area. As such, instead of having all four schedulers and an SM utilize one large pool of resources, each scheduler got their own partition of resources to work with. This combined with a few other improvements to the GPU design resulted in the two-fold performance per watt increase I mentioned earlier. Anyhow, the GTX 750 was geared towards mid-range gamers looking to upgrade from last-gen cards like the GTX 550 Ti. And this it did very well, as at only 119 USD, the GTX 750 was the card to buy, especially considering that it doubled performance and halved power consumption over its GF116 predecessor, the aforementioned GTX 550 Ti. AMD's R7-260X was better priced performance as it had a 10% performance advantage over the GTX 750 at the same price, but it consumed around 50 watts more under load, which was kind of a big deal, especially for HD PCs. As such, the GTX 750 emerged the king of mid-range cards and remained a great budget choice for years to come. So how does it stack up today? Well, unfortunately, the GTX 750 has started to lose its appeal, mainly due to that lack of full DirectX 12 support I mentioned earlier. And with newer, faster cards like the RX 460 starting to become available at the same price, it's becoming harder and harder to recommend the GTX 750 as a budget option. And while the GTX 750 still receives driver updates from Nvidia, I think it's pretty safe to assume that's coming to an end soon, especially with them cutting the cord on Kepler driver support last year. With the card's history out of the way, let's take a look around the card itself. I purchased this card online for around $40 a few years back, and it's been holding up really well in the time that I've had it. The card is made by EVGA, specifically being their super clocked variant, which has the GPU clocked at 1215MHz base and 1294MHz boost, which is a 19% increase over stock. It also has 2GB of VRAM rather than the standard 1GB. Moving on to the cooler, it's a standard aluminum heatsink with a copper core. Paired with this is a large fan, which keeps this card very cool and quiet even with the overclock. The card wears a small black shroud which I think looks great, and its compact size allows the card to fit in a wide variety of systems. So let's get into some overclocking. On top of the factory overclock, we'll be bumping up core clock speeds by 60MHz making for clocks of 1275MHz base and 1354MHz boost, which is a 25% increase over stock frequencies. GPU boost ends up settling the card around 1177MHz at stock and 1400MHz when overclocked. 
As for memory, I set it to 1500MHz, which is a nice 20% increase over stock. Even with the pretty potent overclock, the card ran really cool, maxing out at 60 degrees C with the stock fan curve and a 30 minute Unigen Valley run. Well, there's really not much else to say, so let's get into some benchmarks. The test system specs are on screen. All footage was captured on an external device here, so there will be no hit to performance. Let's see how this card holds up in some games. Our first game up is CSGO, and with the 720p resolution with the low settings and shadows set to high, the card got an average frame rate of 191 FPS, with 1% lows down to 94. When overclocked, averages jumped 11% to 212 FPS, with 1% lows rising 6% to 100. Frame times were very good, and overall the GTX 750 yielded a great experience with this game. Interestingly enough, VRAM was fully saturated here. Next game is Minecraft 1.18.2, and here I ran the game with the 1080p resolution and the fancy settings, along with Optifine and the BSL shaders enabled using the low preset. The card got averages of 43 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. When overclocked, averages jumped 23% to 53 FPS, with 1% lows rising 20% to 36. The game looked great and ran pretty well too, with the overclock providing a really nice boost to frame rates. Next game up is Phasmophobia. I ran the game with the 1080p resolution in the high settings, with AA enabled and 50% texture resolution to keep within our 2GB of VRAM limit. The card managed averages of 63 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. When overclocked, averages jumped 24% to 78 FPS, with 1% lows rising 23% to 37. VRAM was pretty saturated here, and while the game did stutter a little as shown in the 1% lows, it wasn't anything too bad. Locking the frame rate to 60 FPS could smooth out the inconsistent frame times. Project Cars 3 is up next, and here I ran the game with the 1080p resolution and the low preset. We got averages of 37 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. When overclocked, averages jumped 19% to 44 FPS, with 1% lows rising 20% to 36. I think you can see by this point that the 2GB of VRAM really helps this card out. Anyway, at these settings, the card provided a great experience thanks to those smooth frame times. Hitting 60 FPS here is possible if you drop the resolution a little. Our last game up is Tomb Raider. I used the built-in benchmark with the 1080p resolution and the ultra settings, and the card managed averages of 48 FPS, with 1% lows down to 37. When overclocked, averages rose 19% to 57 FPS, with 1% lows also rising 19% to 44. The game looked great, and the consistent frame times made for a super smooth experience, especially when overclocked. To conclude, the GTX 750 is a very good performer considering it's a mid-range card from 8 years ago. All of the games tested today played quite well at 1080p, which really goes to show that this card can still be a viable choice today, even if it won't launch a majority of the newest AAA titles. Not only that, its low power consumption makes it a pretty good card for an OEM system or HTPC as it gets all of its power from the PCIe slot. Overall, while the GTX 750 is definitely showing its age today, it's still a viable performer and pretty good value for the money if you can find it at a good price. Anyhow, that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.